Ready? Okay. You guys are free to start. Okay. Uh, wait till eight o'clock. Anyone needs another minute to get set up? Okay, so uh, let us begin. So welcome everyone to session nine on choices of currencies for use in financial transactions. Uh, this is a session sponsored by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, and Antoine Martin and I as um, organizers of this session are really glad to have you all here. Um, we have three excellent papers and three terrific discussants. So um, let's begin with Digital Money as a Unit of Account and Monetary Policy in Open Economies by Daisuke Ikeda, uh, Bank of Japan. Uh, yeah, Linda, you. thank you very much. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Okay, let me maximize it. Okay, thank you uh, for kind introduction. And I'm very glad, I'm very, very happy to be here uh, with you in this session uh, organized by uh, the New York Fed. And the theme is choices of currencies. And my paper is about choices of currency between digital money and the domestic official currency. So we've seen a rise of digital money around the world. And now we have a variety of digital monies. Specifically, we have a stable coin that seeks to stabilize the price of the coin itself by pegging to a specific official currency. And already many challenges and risks are pointed out. And in this paper, uh, I'd like to discuss the implications for monetary policy. And I focus on the international dimension of digital money. Uh, so here is my favorite speech uh, by Thomas Jordan, uh, chairman of Swiss National Bank. And let me read some excerpts. If Swiss franc stable coins were to proliferate in Switzerland, this would have no immediate impact on the effectiveness of our monetary policy. So if stable coin is pegged to the domestic currency, that would have no immediate impact on the domestic monetary policy. But if stable coins pegged to foreign currencies were to establish themselves in Switzerland, the effectiveness of our monetary policy could be impaired. So if stable coin pegged to a foreign official currency uh, becomes widely used uh, in the domestic country, then the effectiveness of domestic monetary policy uh, could be impaired. And this could be a serious problem. So in this paper, I imagine a situation in which farms and households set prices in units of any currency in any country without incurring any costs. So this is a possible future economy. And in such an economy, farms may start using a digital money pegged to a foreign currency as an invoice currency in the home country. And so this situation is called digital dollarization. Okay. I consider specific three questions. The first, how does digital dollarization affect monetary policy transmission? If firms and households start using digital money pegged to a foreign currency as a unit of account, uh, as an invoice currency, then what is the effect on domestic monetary policy? Second, under what conditions does digital dollarization deepen? The third question is that, can monetary policy, can central bank block or facilitate digital dollarization? So these are three questions I'd like to address in this paper. My approach is to use new open economy macro model. And I focus on a unit of account 
uh, as a role of money, as in the new Keynesian standard new Keynesian model. And so the model I consider is a cashless open economy model with nominal residuals. There are two countries, home and foreign. And the presence of digital money allows pricing in units of foreign currency in home country. Okay. So I assume that using digital money is frictionless and costless. So I study this um, you know, imaginary economy, but possible future economy analytically and numerically. So before walking you through the detail, let me state the main results. The first, about the effect of digital dollarization on monetary policy. The answer is that monetary policy becomes less effective as digital dollarization deepens. The second result is about under what conditions can dollarization deepen. My answer is that dollarization is more likely to occur in a country that is smaller in economic size, more open to trade, and has a greater tradable sector and stronger input output linkages. And the third result is about can a central bank do something about blocking digital dollarization? The answer is yes. Monetary policies, both home and foreign, can affect dollarization, but in a different way. So let me skip the related literature and I walk you very, very quickly uh, the analytical model. The model is based on Cosetti and Pesenti, extended to incorporate many things, but uh, there are two important elements highlighted by Kara Brett. Uh, these are tradable goods as intermediate input and kinked demand curve for tradable goods. Okay. I'll highlight the importance of these two elements later. And for analytical tractability, I assume that prices and wages are set one period in advance. And also I assume that the monetary policy instrument is the nominal aggregate and all shocks are IID. The household problem is standard. The preferences are given by the log utility in consumption. And this is this utility of labor and flow budget constraint. And I assume that the asset market is complete. Okay. The consumption bundle consists of non-tradable consumption bundle and tradable consumption bundle. And in the tradable consumption bundle is aggregated by the Kimball aggregator. So there is a kinked demand curve in the tradable consumption sector. Okay. The firms are standard, are both non-tradable good and tradable good is produced according to the standard Cobb Douglas production function by putting together awards work and intermediate inputs. And these intermediate inputs are in terms of the tradable uh, good, tradable good bundle, okay? So there is a link uh, from the tradable goods to non-tradable goods in this economy. And it's always useful um, to look at flexible price benchmark in analyzing the model with nominal residuals. So if prices are flexible, this is the optimal price, which I call natural price uh, in the tradable uh, goods sector, which is equal to the weighted average of the marginal cost and tradable goods price. And here, parameter alpha captures the degree of the kink uh, in the demand curve in the tradable goods sector. If there is no kink, then the natural price is equal to marginal cost. But because of the presence uh, of the, the Kimball aggregator, there is a kink, the alpha is positive. And also marginal cost here depends on the tradable goods price as well. And so there is a link uh, between tradable goods price and the optimal price. And of course, tradable goods price uh, depends on foreign prices as well. So foreign prices ultimately affect the optimal price in the home country. So with nominal residuals uh, in the form of one period in advance price setting, uh, the home tradable goods price is set at the expected value of the natural price because shocks are IID. And this is a case if currency H, home currency is chosen as an invoice currency. But if 
foreign currency is chosen as an invoice currency, then the price is set at expected natural price in units of the foreign currency, okay, and fixed. But in units of home currency, so there is the log of exchange rate. So the big difference between choosing home currency and foreign currency as an invoice currency is the exchange rate pass through. So if you fix your price um, using the home currency, there is no exchange rate pass through. But if you fix your price using the foreign currency, then there is a hundred percent pass through. Okay. And so this is just a definition of competitive equilibrium. So let me skip. Now I'm going to analyze the real effects of monetary policy. And here I take as given the degree of uh, digital dollarization, dollarization in this economy, okay? So consumption is equal to monetary aggregate minus price level. And if monetary policy um, expands, so this is expansionary monetary policy, if M goes up, then the effect of monetary policy on consumption depends on how price level responds to the monetary policy M. And because of the simplicity of this model, I can analytically derive the price level as a function of exchange rate. And the exchange rate responds one to one to monetary policy. So I can derive analytically the following results. Okay. The impact of home monetary policy on home consumption decreases as more firms use currency F, foreign currency, as an invoice currency. So in other words, as more firms start using foreign currency as an invoice currency, then the home country's monetary policy effectiveness decreases. So this is the analytical result, the first result of this paper. And second question, I'd like to move on to second question, which is about under what conditions can they start the right Sorry, sure. I just want to mention, you can take 20 minutes. I was just looking oh, 20 at minutes. One. So yeah. I have about probably 10 minutes. Yes. Maybe. Okay. Thank you. Um, but it's better not to slow down. Okay. 10 minutes. Um, so the second question is about under what conditions can digital dollarization deepen? To address this question, I have to analyze invoice currency choice by firms. Okay. But the problem is simple. The tradable good firm I chooses whatever the currency that generates the higher expected profits, okay? This is the expected profits when choosing currency H uh, as an invoice currency, okay? And this program can be further simplified if we use second order approximation. So the firm chooses the currency, whichever currency uh, that generates the lower volatility of the natural price. So this makes sense because if the natural price, volatility of natural price is actually zero, then you can hit the natural price for sure, even if you have to set the price one period in advance because there is no volatility. So you prefer um, the currency as an invoice currency that has lower volatility of the natural price. And this problem can be solved analytically. And in analyzing the situation, I have to be more specific about um, import and export prices. And I assume that country F, foreign country, is a dominant currency, uh, a country with a dominant currency, which means that import and export prices are already set in units of currency F. So in this situation, I ask which currency, home or foreign, is used as an invoice currency in country H, okay? So I'd like to emphasize the role of price setting complementarities coming from kink to demand curve alpha and intermediate inputs feeds. And if there is no kink, and if there is no intermediate input as well, then there would be no dollarization. There would be no incentive for home farms to use foreign currency as an invoice currency. So we need either the kink demand curve in the tradable goods sector or 
uh, intermediate inputs. So I assume alpha is greater than zero or some degree of intermediate inputs. Then under this situation, home farms are more likely to set prices in units of foreign currency as more tradable goods prices are set in units of foreign currency. So this is currency choice complementarities. And as home country becomes smaller and as home country becomes more open to trade, more wages are set in units of currency F as intermediate input shares become higher and the degree of the kink in the demand curve increases. So a country that has these features are more likely to, to are more likely to um, experience digital dollarization in the domestic country. Okay. So let me move on to numerical analysis. So in the analytical model, I have made a lot of simplifying assumptions. So here I relax some of them. So in this uh, extended model for numerical analysis, I consider staggered prices and wages as in Calvo for prices and uh, ASL et al for wages. And I allow shocks to be persistent following error and processes, productivity shock, monetary policy shock, and also exchange rate shocks. And now monetary policy's target is, the instrument is the short-term nominal interest rate, which is set according to a standard Taylor rule. And because time is limited, uh, let me mention the parameters. So the home country is parameterized to capture the average OECD countries. And I assume that the home country is relatively small, just 1% uh, relative to the foreign country. But most of the countries uh, in the actual economy are very, very small, like 1% uh, of the total, the global economy. So because of time limitation, I want to say that the result one and two hold uh, in this extended model, that is the proposition one and two hold uh, in this extended model. So the effectiveness of monetary policy decreases as digital dollarization deepen, and also digital dollarization uh, is more likely to occur in a country uh, that has a uh, smaller economic size and more open to trade, okay? So I'd like to focus on the third question about can a central bank block or maybe facilitate digital dollarization in a home country? So these figures answer to the question by plotting net benefits of choosing home currency in the tradable sector as a function of parameters of the monetary policy, okay? So this is net benefits. If net benefit is positive, then the tradable good firms are willing to choose home currency as an invoice currency. But if the values are negative uh, as highlighted by the shaded area, then the firms are willing to choose the foreign currency. So this panel plots the net benefits as a function of inflation coefficient in the table rule. So the standard values are 1.5 or two. So under these monetary policy rules, the net benefits are negative, implying the digital dollarization in the tradable sector in the home country. But if central banks have stronger stance on stabilizing inflation by setting inflation coefficient at five, then the values become above zero. And so that firms now are willing to choose home currency as an invoice currency. So the central bank can block digital dollarization in this case, but the opposite applies to the home central bank. So if foreign central bank has stronger stance on stabilizing inflation, then the net benefits go down. And I plot the net benefits as a function of output coefficient and also the real exchange rate coefficient. 
So the interesting case is the exchange rate coefficient. It is non-monotonic, but if a central bank has very strong stance on stabilizing the real exchange rate, then it is counterproductive, facilitating digital dollarization in home country. And in this case, I confirm numerically that not only the tradable goods sector, but also non-tradable goods sector and the labor market, um, there would be digital dollarization. So let me conclude. So in this paper, I address three questions. The first question is about the impact of digital dollarization on monetary policy. And my answer is that the monetary policy's capacity to stabilize the real economy weakens as digital dollarization deepens. And the second question is about under what conditions can digital dollarization deepen? The answer is that a country that has uh, stronger linkages uh, with falling country and that is more open to trade and smaller in economic size. And the third question is about, can monetary policy discourage dollarization? Answer is yes, especially by focusing on stabilizing inflation. So let me conclude uh, with three caveats. In this paper, I exclusively focus on a unit of account as a role of money, but there is other role of money, such as medium of exchange. And also I assume frictionless, costless digital money, but if we really want to model stable coins, then the stable coins are backed by safe assets. So there would be consequences on demand for safe assets. And finally, I consider currency F, foreign currency or home currency, but there could be synthetic currency as argued by Mark Carney. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The uh, discussant is Kenza Benhima, University of Lausanne. Okay, um, so yeah, let me share my screen. Okay. So do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper. I enjoyed reading the paper. Uh, it's very insightful and I really like the, especially the simple version of the model. Um, and the, um, I find the emphasis on the pass through uh, really uh, insightful. Now, let me summarize uh, the paper. So the paper is based on the premise that uh, digital currencies will uh, enable uh, invoicing in foreign currency more easily. So the question is, what happens if all goods in the economy, so all sectors, um, could be subject to uh, pricing in foreign currency? So not only the tradable goods sector, as it, I mean, has been considered uh, usually in the literature, but also the non-tradable goods sector, but also the labor uh, sector. Now. Um, also something to, to emphasize is that it's digital currency as a unit of account. So uh, putting aside the role of store of, um, store of value and uh, medium exchange, so really just pricing. Um, and then the model uh, has uh, as features input output linkages, linkages and complementarities in pricing. And in this setup, uh, so uh, Daisuke looks at the effectiveness of monetary policy and also at the incentives to dollarize. So what he shows is that there are complementarities in invoicing uh, on the one hand and on the other hand, um, well, uh, this also puts constraints on monetary policy. So if you want to prevent uh, dollarization, uh, we need to follow some, for some types of policy. So this is a constraint. Okay, so what drives, um, sorry, what drives digital dollarization uh, in the paper? So there is a kind of contagion of uh, foreign currency pricing. So I found three channels uh, that, uh, I mean, are in this, uh, the, the model. So first, uh, there is contagion through production chains. So you want to price in foreign currency when your inputs are priced in foreign currency. There is an upstream, downstream, uh, contagion. There is also 
contagion in a sense through price competition because you want to price in foreign currency when your competitors price in the foreign currency. So this is this happens through the, the price setting complementarities that you have in the market. And finally, uh, there is also some contagion that happens through input substitution. And this is in particular the case for uh, wages. Uh, so, so, the, so I understand the, the um, uh, you know, the incentive to price wages in foreign currency um, as a result of, uh, you know, like uh, wages are used in production and you have other inputs and these are tradable inputs and if these are priced in foreign currency, when you have a depreciation, they become more expensive, so you want to use more labor and as a result, uh, well, uh, household, they would like to to be paid more in that case. So uh, in that case, if the price, uh, you know, if wage is priced in a foreign currency, uh, the depreciation is also going to increase the nominal wage. So this happens through, through uh, input substitution. Okay, so in the end, uh, you have um, uh, pricing in a, in a common currency, uh, so foreign currency pricing, if you will, when the country is more open, integrated, but also, so uh, Daisuke did not have time to show you, also when you have more corre correlated shocks, so with the foreign country. Um, so I think it has a nice interpretation as, you know, you get uh, incentives to price in foreign currency when you are kind of in an optimal currency area, in a sense. Um, so in that sense, the, all these motives are consistent with uh, the... With, uh, what the literature has, has found. Um, also, the motive for foreign currency pricing is an insurance motive. So basically, uh, firms and households, they want to, to minimize the volatility of profits or of, uh, of, or of utility. So in a sense, this is uh, what I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is the right word, but this is an intrinsic motive in the sense that this is a motive that has to do with the structure of the economy and not with the, with the specificity of digital currency. Um, so the question is in that, so since this is an intrinsic motive, why didn't we observe more traditional dollarization in the past? And also, well, the question is what makes digital dollarization difference, which I think is, is important you know, like uh, to ask uh, in the sense that what we would like to know is whether digital uh, currencies are going to change, uh, you know, the uh, structure of the economy and the way we uh, we perform monetary policy and policies in general. So, uh, so I try to, to 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 think, you know, what are the factors that may have prevented currency competition so far. Uh, and I found some answers in, in a very nice paper by Brunner Mayer, James, and Land, Landau on, um, on digital currencies. So what they highlight is in the case of pricing in digital currencies. So what could so what is important here are cognitive costs. So basically, why do you want to price in a common currency? Is because you don't want to keep track of all the relative prices. So with one currency, you just need to keep track of uh, end prices when you have end goods. The second uh, argument uh, that you know, like, prevents currency competition uh, is that you have strong network, network externalities. You basically want to price in the same uh, currency that you know, the rest, uh, the other uh, agents in the economy price. Uh, so it's like a common language. Okay, so now uh, with digital dollarization, what makes currency competition more likely? So first you can have some kind of cost reduction. So with, uh, you know, like uh, um, with the technology, you can have instantaneous uh, conversion uh, between currencies. So no need for a common language in that case that reduces the cogn cognitive costs. Uh, but also in the case of digital dollarization, you can also have extrinsic motives in the sense that this has to do with the incentives to use digital uh, currency per se, and not because they, it's useful for other uh, things. So for instance, just because it's more efficient, uh, but also because uh, it, um, 
it is um, uh, it is used through digital networks and digital platforms. So here the idea is that digital currency comes with an array of services. Like if you think of Amazon, uh, you know you will have the choice. You know you you if you, you, you buy on Amazon, uh, uh, you know because they have all this data and information. You can have selection of a product so that is really ta tailored. For you, so yeah, so it comes with some advantages that are actually, uh, you know, specific to digital currency. Now, there is also so in in um, uh, this idea of uh, digital currency area, um, where uh, you know consumers will buy, uh, you know, in uh, you know some digital currency on Amazon. In that case, dollarization happens for final goods. Um, so it means that the dollarization of domestic goods is relevant, but in this case, it happens more downstream. So the upstream downstream uh, contagion is perhaps less relevant in that case. But here, uh, you know, like just the assumption that dollarization happens through digital networks and digital platform, it, it also can also happen uh, through other channels like CBDC. And maybe in that case, it will be still different, but again, it's difficult to, uh, to, to predict. Now, um, my second point is about um, the monetary policy conundrum. So in the paper, monetary policy is either ineffective because of digital dollarization, or it is constrained to prevent digital dollarization. Um, so in that case, in your model, that would mean that the central bank has to put an emphasis on price stabilization to avoid digital dollarization. Now, is it really a constraint? So here, the key question is, um, for instance, here, is it optimal actually to, to stabilize the price? And um, well, a key question um, is that is price stabilization optimal under domestic currency pricing? And, in more, and more generally, monetary policy, uh, typically the uh, purpose is to replicate the flexible price equilibrium. And if you, well, what it means is that basically it makes uh, nominal rigidities irrelevant. So in the end, you don't need, uh, you don't need insurance for currency pricing because, well, the government is taking, it, it's taking it is in charge, basically. So, so two questions. So is, uh, does, can monetary policy replicate the flexible price equilibrium? And second, is the flexible price equilibrium optimal? Because it's not always the case. It depends on, it, on the nature of shock. So basically, whether this is actually a constraint depends on the, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the structure of the economy and, and of shocks. Um, now, finally, uh, regarding this policy conundrum, can domestic CBDC prevent digital dollarization? Uh, so, uh, for instance, yesterday there was a talk about all the different functionalities that the CBDC can bring, like privacy, traceability. So it can be uh, it can be uh, attractive to to actually uh, so this CBDC can be made attractive and prevent maybe digitalization. Um, and perhaps because one important channel is the foreign sector, then inter interoperability would be particularly uh, important. So finally, two minor points. So in your paper, uh, the currency choice is endogenous, and you focus on a partial equilibrium analysis. But I wonder if you could also look at the, uh, you know, uh, equilibrium. So general equilibrium, whether and ask whether the equilibrium is unique or multiple, and maybe if you have some exogenous fraction of foreign currency uh, pricing, uh, what is the fraction that will, you know, drive the, the equilibrium from one type of pricing to another type of pricing? And finally, uh, last question. So, uh, so and, and actually you discussed that in the end. So why would the global digital currency be the dollar? Uh, could that be some um, uh, other stable coins like the Libra, which are not pegged to particular currency? And in that case, how, how, would you, how do you think that would change? Uh, your results. So yeah, I will stop here and just uh, bottom line, I, I like the paper. I think it's timely and insightful. Uh, but yeah, so my, my talk was more like just some food for thought. Thank you. So thank you, Ken Kenza. Um, thank you, Daisuke. Let me open it up to the session participants if you have questions or comments. 
You could also put it in the chat. We had um, one question about which uh, country has the potential to do digital dollarization. I think your answer would be about countries that are small and quite open uh, to trade, but any other questions? I guess a question, one question I have that maybe you could also answer is um, beyond um, reaching, as Kenza said, um, final goods prices, uh, is there any real difference between digital currency choice and any other currency choice on transactions? So what's the part that is specifically associated with being digital. So maybe uh, Daisuke, you could take a few minutes uh, to respond. Thank you very much, Linda. And thank you, uh, many thanks, Kenza, uh, for a very insightful discussion. Um, so there are basically three questions. First is what is special about uh, digital dollarization, um, especially relative to traditional uh, dollarization we've seen in some countries, some, for example, developing countries. And here, I'd like to emphasize that uh, central bank is independent, and so monetary policy is set by following Taylor rule, and also there is no fiscal imbalances. And so, so what country in my mind is, um, for example, advanced economy with strong institutions, independent central bank, and strong uh, fiscal authority. And my argument is that even in such a country, digital dollarization can happen. And if uh, digital money, uh, which is costless and frictionless and in using it. And so, so to Linda's question, um, to be honest, in this model, I don't model money explicitly. And so I assume that, simply assume that using uh, digital money that is pegged, perfectly pegged to a foreign currency, uh, using it is costless and frictionless. And so farms and households are free to choose whether to set prices or wages in units of home currency or foreign currency. So that's the situation I consider. Uh, but I admit that uh, in practice, uh, there are uh, the costs, for example, cognitive costs uh, mentioned by Kenza, and we don't model the costs uh, explicitly, uh, but we can add more structure uh, if we have uh, more specific ideas of uh, the digital money, specific digital money we want to analyze. And the second question, Kenza's question, is about the optimal level of price stabilization. Uh, question is that there are two countries. And so if we fix, take as given, the foreign monetary policy, it may not be optimal to stabilize prices completely because there is still some degree of nominal residues coming from foreign countries. So of course, if we consider a uh, coordinated you know, central bank, uh, which sets uh, which can set monetary policy in a coordinated manner, then um, my guess is that uh, stabilizing prices, stabilizing prices in both home and foreign countries um, would be efficient uh, in, this, in this model because the main source of uh, friction is nominal residues. But I think the important, uh, the interesting point uh, in analyzing the role of central bank in blocking or facilitating dollarization is that the monetary policy is not only about price stabilization, but it affects the incentive of firms to choose an uh, invoice currency. And the choice of invoice currency has consequences on monetary policy, uh, as I studied uh, the first question. Okay. And of course, in this model, I don't consider CBDC and um, the everything uh, depends on the detail of how we model digital money or CBDC. And of course, there is always potential 
uh, that CBDC uh, could prevent uh, digital dollarization. And the detail, uh, small points about uh, multiple equilibrium. I don't think there is a multiple equilibrium uh, in this model, um, but um, there, uh, there is a, um, under a specific parameterization, there could be uh, multiple equilibria when uh, firms are indifferent uh, between choosing home currency and foreign currency. And thank you, that's, that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the second paper of the session. Uh, international Trade and the Currency Composition of Corporate Debt, and Yang Jiao from Fudan University will present. Um, can you see my slides clearly? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me uh, click. Okay. So, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay, um, so uh, thanks uh, uh, to the organizer, and uh, especially Linda for including our paper to the wonderful conference. Uh, so today I will present a paper titled International Trade and the Currency Composition of Corporate Debt. Uh, I'm Yang Zhao from Fudan University and my co-author is Ou Ying Kuang, who is also in the attendee, uh, and also Ji Wago from the Han and Sun University from South Korea. Okay. So uh, in this paper, what do we do? So uh, we know that uh, in developing or emerging countries, uh, when a firm, um, expect, you know, the corporate sector, when they borrow from abroad, they usually borrow in foreign currency. This is true, for example, for Philippines, for Thailand, and also for China as well. So this is kind of a foreign and you know a currency a risk exposure, right? So, but we know that in reality, firms not only exposed to foreign currency debt, but also they can, uh, they are exposed to uh, foreign currency risk through international trade, right? So, uh, for example. Uh, we know that there's a dominant currency argument that usually uh, when firms do international trade for emerging and uh, developing countries, they usually invoice in foreign currency instead of their domestic currency. Right? So in this paper, we basically combine these two dimensions of currency risk, and we want to investigate it, uh, how international trade can causally affect firms' choice of currency composition of debt. Okay? This is actually coined as operational hedge, right? Operation means that firms actually use their uh, you know, day-to-day uh, -day operations to hide their risk. Okay? So this is about their sales and their input. So we think that this is uh, particularly uh, uh, relevant for developing and emerging countries because there are going to be very limited financial hedge in these countries due to the, uh, for example, due to the undeveloped uh, financial market. And also in recent years, uh, these countries have been more integrated in international trade. So, uh, so we think that the relationship between international trade and the firm's choice of their of currency composition of debt is important for firms at the, you know, for their risk management. On the other hand, uh, why do we care at the macro level? We think that this has some implications from the macro policy. Uh, there is a, a, a huge literature in international finance about uh, balance sheet effects, right? So which basically says that if uh, a firm uh, revenue side is in domestic currency, but if they are exposed to foreign currency debt, they are going to subject to currency mismatch. Right? So, so we, we see a lot of theoretical um, papers or models that actually directly assume that firms have domestic uh, uh, currencies income and foreign currency debt. But to what extent these firms are exposed to this balance sheet effect uh, is not clear unless we have very detailed firm level data. So in this paper, uh, we want to use uh, data from micro level data from South Korea to see to what extent firms will use this operational hedge to manage their foreign in, uh, exchange risk. And also we think that this call uh, inference is important because if we just merely see that there is a correlation between exporting and the foreign currency borrowing, that doesn't tell us directly that the firms are actually doing endogenous hedging. So there could be unobserved factors that can drive both 
uh, exporting activities and also foreign currency borrowing. So I can give you a very simple example. Uh, so for instance, if a firm has a management team has a lot of overseas experience, the firm may have, uh, you know, may jointly, you know, have uh, export activities and also foreign currency borrowing. But this doesn't directly tell us that the firms are actively doing this operational hedge to manage their foreign exchange rates. So uh, uh, this is our outline. So we will first provide a very stylish model for the uh, endogenous uh, currency composition choice for their data side. So they need to use uh, that to finance the project, uh, uh, but they need to decide uh, the currency composition of the debt. So they will take uh, the, their exports and the domestic sales opportunities as given. So essentially we will show that when the firm has a higher export shares, for given firms, they will endogenously respond by uh, increasing their foreign currency data shares. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, the, the motive behind this result is basically that the firm tries to uh, manage the, uh, the rates, uh, aggregate rates of the firm. Okay. So uh, we will go to the detail. So with this uh, uh, stylized models conclusion in mind, we will try to test this relationship between export share and the foreign currency data shares. So firstly, we use uh, South Korea's firm level data. We try to show cross-sectional patterns. Cross-sectional patterns means that for a given year, uh, we observe that exporters actually borrow more in foreign currency uh, in terms of foreign currency shares, right? So foreign currency debt shares. Uh, and also within exporters, do we see that a firm uh, with a larger sh a share of their export sales in, uh, in their total revenues actually also is related to a larger foreign currency debt share. But uh, clearly, this is just a correlation, right? So, to, uh, so there are many firms' characteristics are not controlled in this case. Uh, so we will do another exercise, which is called a long difference of OIS. Essentially, we difference out all the time invariant of fixed effect. Right? But still, there will still be some endogenity concerns because uh, uh, if we go back to uh, my previous example, maybe the firm changes its uh, management team. Previously, maybe the firm doesn't have a management team with a lot of overseas experience, and later they, they have a management team with a lot of overseas experience that can drive the firms to uh, international trade and also to foreign currency borrowing simultaneously. In order to uh, solve this kind of endogenity concerns, we will try to use a long difference with IV, instrumental variable approach. So to address these endogenity concerns, we propose a new method to instrument these export shares the basic idea is simple. If we think about a firm's export shares, what factors are going to affect uh, these uh, export shares of a firm? So it can be a supply side factors, right? So directly related to the firm's characteristics. It can also come from uh, foreign demand shocks. Right? So uh, we will use the foreign demand shock, which is going to be possibly orthogonal to the firm's characteristics that can drive this export shares change of the firm. Uh, so that we will essentially use all South Korea's trading part of the demand shock at the industry level uh, in a certain period to show that actually when we use this uh, IV approach, we still get to this conclusion uh, that export shares uh, increase will lead to a foreign currency data share increase. We provide additional robustness checks and uh, also some additional findings that are going to be consistent with our story. So firstly, we take into account the financial hedge. In our data set, we also observe uh, the financial derivatives related to currencies uh, for the firm. So that we, uh, we actually exclude uh, uh, the small sample of firms that actually have this financial hedge instrument. And we find that our results are robust. And if any, the results are going to be uh, slightly strong. And also uh, for our IV, there may be some uh, concerns on the exclusion restrictions. Okay? So we will talk in detail. And we try to address some concerns here. And also we try to use a different concept uh, in the debt construction, right? So which is called a net debt. Net debt is essentially debt minus cash holdings because we, we, when we think that the firms may hold some foreign currency cash to hedge the uh, currency rates. Right? So we also take that into account and find that our results are robust and uh, if any, slightly stronger. And finally, we also take into account the zone of itinerary regime. We know that uh, South Korea, before uh, uh, the Asian financial crisis within uh, like uh, 1990s, uh, actually most of the time they have a crawling path. It essentially says that uh, South Korea has very limited fluctuations in its uh, currency relative to US dollars. 
So in that period, we do not expect that the firms have a high need to do this operational hedge. But after 1999, after the Asian financial crisis, South Korea changed to a fully floating itinerary regime. We see a much uh, larger volatility of its itinerary. So in that period, we would imagine that these firms actually use operational hedge to manage their foreign currency risk. And finally, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, due to the rise of the global supply chains, we also take into account the import side of the firm. If the firms uh, have some, uh, you know, for their input, if they also have some foreign currency input, right? So essentially it's a foreign input. Uh, then it will also affect the foreign currency debt choice, endogenous foreign currency debt choice. And uh, we will extend our model and do some inquiries based on that. Okay. So uh, this literature I will just uh, directly skip. Uh, this includes our uh, wonderful discussion of Bruno and Shin's paper as well. Okay, so this is uh, the simple model here. We have uh, a, a single firm with a probability phi, and uh, the firm needs to decide its borrowing in both uh, home currency and foreign currency. So we only have two currencies, either home or foreign. And the firm can sell domestically and they can also sell internationally. So it has domestic sales and export sales. They will take a demand function that is given and try to decide the size of the firm. So the firm's decision is going to be a two-stage decision. In the first stage, what the firm do? does? The, the firm will borrow in uh, domestic currency B and a foreign currency B star. And we will normalize the first period is change to one, right? So they will borrow in B and B star to finance their capital goods K. So that's the first period. And they take interest rate R and R star as given. Okay, so this is a domestic interest rate and this is a foreign interest rate in each currency respectively. However, in this period, they do not know the realization of the chain rate shock in the future period. In the future period, it's called the production stage. In the production stage, it wastes their capital K. Market. And they will face two demand functions here, uh, which are constant elasticity demand functions. Uh, so P and P star are price. Okay? So in each market. And E and E star are going to be the, the uh, demand shifters. Okay? So and eta is the demand elasticity. We will assume full depreciation of capital after production just for simplicity. Okay? So this is the basic setup of the, uh, of the, uh, the two stages. So in order to solve the model, uh, we will use a two uh, a backward manner. Okay? So we essentially start from the second period and then we go back to the first period. In the second period, what does the firm do? Uh, the firm knowing already knows so this cosine, right? So this is the realization of the second period between rates. And they also already borrow B and B star. They are already uh, embedded, right? So they borrow in the first period. So B and B star, they need to pay back in uh, different currencies. So the firm's profit maximization problem is as follows. So the first term is their domestic revenue, right? Price uh, multiplied by quantity. And the second term is going to be their foreign revenues. And note there is a cosine here. Right? So, so it's going to be subject to exchange risk from the first stage's point of view. And also they need to pay their domestic input cost. Okay? So you can think of this is just a label. And moreover, uh, they need to pay back their debt. So this is the B is domestic debt and the B side is the foreign debt. Here, there's also another cosine here, which is also the exchange rate shock that is not realized in the first period. And the firm needs to take that into account. Right? So essentially, for the firm, they will face exchange rates both in the revenue side and also in the debt side. And we can solve this model uh, by a, 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 you know, getting this Q and Q star uh, by taking the demand function that's given and also solve this optimal L, and we get the following um, formula. The following formula basically says that if the firm already has a very large capital stock, the revenue is going to be high, right? So this is intuitive. And also, if one can see that this cosine will also enter the, uh, the first term once we already solve this optimal label input here. Uh, and still, there is going to be a extremely shock for their uh, debt payments uh, in the second period. 
And here we will introduce a very important notation, which is alpha. Alpha is going to be the uh, E star over E e plus E star. What's this? This is going to be the export shear currently. So export shear uh, is from it's actually from this demand uh, function, right? So E and E star are, are demand shifters basically. So E a star over E plus E star all this alpha basically denotes the export shear. So with uh, this second uh, stage uh, solution, we go back to the first stage. For the first stage, we assume that the funds activity function is going to be risk worse. This is a very simple mean uh, variance uh, functional form. Okay? And this gamma is going to be the, uh, the risk of washing pi is the profit of the firm. Okay, so although we directly assume a risk of worse uh, utility function for the firm, we can actually, in our online appendix, we actually micro found this uh, utility function. By, uh, by introducing financial frictions in an extended period for inherently risk neutral firms. Essentially, risk neutral firms plus some for, for forms of financial frictions will give you some uh, formula of this risk of washing. So, with this risk of washing, one can imagine if we have a UIP and covered interest parity, basically borrowing in foreign currency and borrowing in local currency are going to be, uh, you know, from a expect, you know, expectation is going to be the same cost, right? And if the form is risk or worse, the forms will ex anti fully eliminate uh, ex anti risk. So essentially, for these objective functions, they will make this variance equal to zero. However, if uh, US dollar borrowing is, uh, for example, is cheaper, the form will indulgently uh, exposed to some kind of uh, you know, uh, foreign currency risk uh, when they choose their uh, foreign currency debt and the local currency debt combination. So uh, in any case, on the UIP, we can have some uh, very uh, analytic results, which is that the optimal foreign currency data share, which is the total uh, foreign currency borrowing divided by the total borrowing, uh, is going to be an uh, increasing function of the export share alpha. So with this in mind, uh, we go to the uh, data part. Okay? So for the data, it's actually the Korean uh, uh, information service data set. It, uh, basically, by law of Korean firms with uh, uh, asset larger than 7 billion one are required to report uh, their uh, balance sheets. Uh, but some smaller firms may voluntarily report. So uh, actually our data set includes both big firms and a small firm. And this advantage is also uh, pointed out by Kim, his and Zhang. You, you have five minutes. Sure, thank you. One important feature uh, of the uh, data set is that uh, it includes uh, foreign currency debt uh, information. So now we go to the data set. We first compare the data quality. We find that when we sum up all the case data total exports and compare that with UN Com trade, uh, which is the official exports, the total export, we actually check each other very well. Okay. Uh, so for the sake of time, I'll skip this. Uh, but here, this I, I want you to uh, see. The, for Korea, uh, for their exports, it's mostly invoiced in US dollars. And uh, very rarely, it's in Korean one. So essentially, you can assume that uh, the Korean and, and firms exporters uh, export revenue as are basically foreign currency instead of a local currency. Okay. So and also this is uh, uh, extremely the fluctuation for the Korean one against the US dollar. We can see that the volatility of the Korean one against US dollar is much larger on, after the uh, Asian financial crisis. So uh, we basically have around uh, 5,000 firms uh, between uh, this 1999 to 2007. I will skip this summary statistics. Uh, but I want to, one factor I want to point out is that in our data set, we find that exporters alone act, actually account for around the two thirds of the total foreign currency borrowing in the uh, case data. So basically the foreign currency borrowing are mostly fall on these exporters. So uh, for our empirics, so we try to show a positive relationship between the uh, left-hand side variable is the foreign currency data shear, right-hand side variable is the export shear. And uh, this is the cross-sectional patterns. And then we go to a long difference. Essentially, we use a foreign currency sh uh, data shear in 2007 and minus that by this 1999 foreign currency data shear. And for right-hand side variable, we do that similar. And then we will use this instrumental variable approach. Uh, so this is our result. We just try to show that there is a positive correlation here. Okay. 
Uh, and this is a long difference. Still, there is a positive correlation. Uh, but uh, when we include a lot of controls, it, the results are still relaxed. However, there is endogenic concerns, as I mentioned at the beginning, right? So in order to solve that endogenic concerns, what do we do? Uh, so for the, at the firm level, when the firm's export sales increase, it can be driven by firm's own characteristics of foreign demand shocks, right? So we will try to use foreign demand shocks to uh, instrument the firm's growth rates in this, this export shares so that we can have an instrument for this change in export shares. So that's the basic idea. So how to get to the uh, firm level uh, demand shock? So the firm I is in industry G, right? So for each Korea's industry G, it will sell to many countries like China, like uh, the United States. And for China and the United States, uh, during this period, they will also import from other countries. For example, China's import of electronics may increase dramatically in this period, right? So if China's uh, uh, share of this import of, uh, so when, from South Korea's point of view, when they export, China is a big player for its exporting destination, then China's large increase in their import growth for these electronics is going to be a, a big shock to, a positive shock to Korean firms in that industry. Yang, you'll need to go towards the conclusions. It's one minute to left. Okay, sure. Uh, so I will do that later. So uh, I, we, I just try to show that there is a, actually a positive relationship here. Uh, and I will skip the robustness checks, uh, but I will just show you one table on the import side. When we show, uh, we include the uh, uh, import share change, we also get a negative uh, relationship, which is going to be opposite to the positive uh, coefficient before the change in export share. This is going to be consistent with our extended model when we take into account of global supply chain. So this is the conclusion. We basically investigated the role international trade in shipping firms' currency composition with that. We provide a very sized model and the cross-sectional patterns, long difference and IV approach using South Korea's uh, firm level data. And we perform a lot of uh, robustness checks and take into account the global supply chains. So, so uh, I think our uh, results will uh, show that the firms endogenous hedge, right? So this may provide uh, additional uh, insight for the quantitative exercise for the balance sheet effect in international finance. But to what extent this effect, uh, this endogenous hedging will uh, alter the, the uh, impact of exchange shocks through the balance sheet effect is going to be left for future research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, discussant is Valentina Bruno from American University. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Here it is. Okay, let's see. Okay, so Linda, thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to discuss this uh, very interesting paper. Uh, most of the, the issues that are really at the heart of, uh, of my work, uh, as, as, as you will see. Uh, let me start uh, with uh, uh, the general uh, summary of of, of the paper. The paper really focuses on the determinants of foreign currency composition of, of corporate debt. And it's uh, on a specific uh, uh, period of time, uh, 1999 to 2007 uh, for, uh, for the case of Korea. Uh, the main result is that there is this uh, uh, correlation slash causation uh, between uh, a currency uh, uh, debt and uh, 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 exposure to uh, uh, foreign revenues. Uh, and in particular, it seems that the firms raise a foreign currency debt when export revenues are, are higher. Uh, and uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, export revenues are so that the foreign currency debt uh, is uh, mostly denominated in, in dollar. And uh, the nice thing of the paper is this attempt to resolve uh, uh, this, this nightmare uh, for us of, uh, of endogeneity by using uh, a, uh, an, an 
NIV identification that shows the casual effect, the ca causal effect of trade on foreign currency debt. One of the messages from, uh, from the paper is that um, if firms endogenously choose a foreign debt uh, as a function of trade, uh, exchange rate movements uh, will have a muted effect on their balance sheets. Uh, um, so um, I would focus to my comments around these uh, two bullet points, so one around the operational aging and one about around the, 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 concluding, uh, 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 the concluding message on, uh, uh, that has important implication for financial stability. So as I said, this is a topic at the heart of my, of my work. It was not always like this, to me, like this. My PhD has been on something totally different. Then I got uh, inspiration, uh, like really like a structural shock by Linda's uh, seminal paper, uh, the JF uh, 2012 with Cetorelli, looking more at the financing side uh, in terms of cross-border. Uh, so I took uh, a train to Princeton uh, where I met Yoon after so many years and that started uh, this new line of, uh, of research for me. Um, and I was hoping one day to really discuss a paper on Korea uh, for, for various reasons, including uh, the fact that uh, I watched uh, a movie, The Fault, one of the, one of the best movies uh, really in, uh, with an economic subject uh, I have ever seen. I'm, I'm not so sure that my IMF friends uh, would agree with, with my statement, but it's really all about the role of foreign, uh, foreign debt and the risks that uh, foreign debt uh, um, uh, brings uh, with, uh, uh, for in this case, uh, in, in terms of, of a country. Um, so let me, let me go back to the, to the paper. So the, the period, uh, uh, covered in, the, in, in, in this paper uh, is pre-financial crisis. And, uh, and actually after the financial crisis, uh, firms start behaving differently. So for instance, for the case of China, uh, e, uh, and, and co-authors find uh, uh, kind of this uh, uh, opposite result where firms with high foreign exposure uh, tend to uh, uh, issue uh, in uh, uh, tend to ten, tends to issue less in uh, in dollar denominated uh, uh, currency in terms of of bonds and uh, i uh, in, in more general terms for emerging economies uh, also with with yun we find that uh, uh, these uh, uh, that that we find a sort of corporate version of carry trade strategies where firms use dollar debt to accumulate uh, financial assets in, uh, in in domestic currency more for uh, financial reasons than for uh, uh, um, uh, growth and, and investment. So, but this paper look at uh, the pre period of uh, of the financial uh, uh, crisis. And they exclude uh, the post financial crisis. Uh, and they say in the paper, because of the introduction of capital controls, uh, that uh, may create a spurious uh, um, results. Um, but really, many countries introduce macro prudential policies after the global financial crisis. And, uh, and, for, and if, I, if I were to write a paper like this, I would actually have included uh, the post-financial crisis, uh, where Korea introduced uh, several macro policies, including the levy on uh, foreign bank credit, uh, foreign bank credit. Uh, and given that uh, he is showing that uh, China is having a carry trade strategy, we show also that on average emerging markets uh, after the great financial crisis tend to issue more for financial reasons than for real reasons uh, or for investments. Uh, uh, one question so that to me would be incredibly interesting to answer is whether Korea is actually different uh, thanks uh, to macroprudential policies uh, and whether continues uh, the pre-global financial crisis trends of issuing uh, for, uh, for these operational aging uh, uh, type of motives. 
Uh, the, the core really of the paper is this uh, instrumental variable uh, uh, that uh, uses foreign demand shocks to construct an instrument uh, to capture the exogenous variations of firms' export shares. Uh, uh, and, you know, we can think about uh, then when is the shock to foreign demand, uh, exports goes down, and so demand of dollar, dollar credit uh, is going down. So where I'm going with this, uh, uh, this is really I'm going uh, to, uh, to the financial aspects of uh, bond issuances, uh, because over 83% of trade finance, uh, uh, which is used exactly for for uh, exports and working capital uh, is denominated in, in dollar. And who are uh, the, those providing uh, dollar credit are all the, the global banks. Uh, the ones that Linda uh, in her JF paper showed us uh, uh, for the first time uh, and show us how you know, everything moves uh, uh, around the world in a, in a, global, in a global way. Uh, for us, uh, for us, uh, the real important element is the role of exchange rates, um, where given the, given the fact that the global banks are the providers of these dollar denominated credit, especially for trade finance. So let's assume, let's take, let's consider a global lender with a diversified portfolio of dollar uh, uh, credits uh, to borrowers around the world. Uh, some borrowers uh, face a currency mismatch. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Korean firm, but uh, you have, we have really take this uh, portfolio, this global portfolio approach. Uh, so dollar depreciations against the old baskets implies a reductions in credit risk for individual borrowers, uh, reduced the tailor risk for a diversified portfolio, value at risk goes down and the determinant spare lending capacity given economic capital. All of these uh, generates easier credit conditions, something that we call the, the risk uh, uh, taking channel of currency depreciation. Um, so what does it mean in a macro sense? So if we look at uh, the correlation between the exchange rate as captured by the dollar broad index uh, in black uh, and uh, total credit, uh, that's the, the red line. We see that especially after the global financial crisis, these two lines tends to uh, correlate, uh, tends, to move, uh, tends to move together which means that when the dollar is strong, uh, credit, uh, uh, US dollar credit to emerging markets goes down and, and vice versa. So one of the interesting aspects that I've been exploring more recently are, is related to the real effects. So I have a paper uh, again with Yoon that looks at the real effects coming from for these uh, financial conditions from these global financial conditions related to dollar credit. And two so here again, minutes. sorry, two. how much? Two. Two minutes. Okay, I'm I'm wrapping up with uh, with this chart. Then so. In black, we have again the broad dollar index uh, and in blue, the uh, uh, exports. Uh, and so again, after the financial crisis, we see that uh, uh, these two lines tend to move together, meaning that uh, uh, there seems to be also, on, in addition of a global demand and everything, uh, a financial reasons uh, uh, related to working capital uh, productions and therefore exports uh, that have a real effect uh, in the economy, kind of uh, think about the motto, what happens in financial markets, it doesn't stay in financial markets, but it does have uh, uh, consequences for the, for the real economy. And specifically in this paper I have with Yoon, we look at the case of Mexico, and we find that the banks uh, uh, supply credit uh, also as a function of the global financial conditions. Uh, and, the, and if they reduce the trade of credit, uh, trade finance uh, to firms after controlling for demand conditions and other effect, if banks reduce uh, supply of credit, then the firms get in trouble. And they might have issues in terms of financing their working capital. 
So let me wrap up. Uh, this, uh, uh, one of the messages is related to this mute, uh, muted effect of exchange rate movements. Uh, but, uh, you know, thinking about the movie Default, uh, I'm really less, uh, also less optimistic. I wish I could be more optimistic, but, uh, you know, really the movie uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is kind of uh, uh, gloomy on that, on that, on that aspect. Uh, uh, because when the exchange rate affect also credit supply, this will eventually have an effect on, on the economy. And let me wrap up again with another influential work uh, by, by Linda uh, on dollar invoicing. Uh, we know that uh, trade is invoiced uh, in, uh, in dollar. And she was, uh, she was the first one pointing to that aspect. So this implies that refinancing requirements also translate in the need of dollar credit. But if dollar credit also goes end in end with the financial conditions more broadly, then there might be also financial aspects to, uh, to consider that might be really related to uh, uh, the currency compositions of, of, of that at, at the firm level. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much, Valentina. Um, we have a question um, in the uh, chat from Talisa Olia from the University of Indonesia and uh, asking, how about the role of domestic financing conditions such as domestic interest rate, higher cost of fund in the domestic country as an alternative of foreign debt that influences the decisions of corporates to choose foreign currency debt? Um, and, um, you know, Yang, you could answer that later in the chat or now um, along with Valentina's questions and let me open it up for any other um, questions, interventions. Okay, so I, I think, you know, Valentina raised um, a number of credit uh, questions specifically about the supply of credit, not just the demand for credit. So maybe um, you could address how we should think about the supply of credit uh, being driven by some of the same and some different forces, including exchange rates and how you would adjust for that. So. Um, thank you very much, Linda. Yeah, um, and also thanks uh, very much to uh, Valentina on the very uh, insightful discussions. Um, I think the uh, the the points are very good here. So firstly, let me respond to the supply side factors. I uh, I think uh, so. Uh, we actually uh, are doing more work to address, like, uh, to control for more supply side factors now. And in particular, in our data set, we actually have uh, some kind of information with, uh, very similar to Japan's case, like uh, from the main bank. Uh, from the main bank, it's like the, the, the bank may you know, uh, engage in the, it's typically the largest lender of the firm, and it's also typically engaging in the firm's trade financing, kind of this, you know, this kind of activities. And what we do is that uh, in order to control for these types of supply shocks, we actually try to uh, add this mean bank dummy. And if we do that, actually we find that our imperial results, uh, you know, uh, uh, do not change much. So essentially the point estimates are very similar. So we can for sure control for uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, at least to some extent of these supply side factors. And also your point uh, on, the, uh, on the post to, uh, 2008, uh, I think it's also very good. I think in, the, in our paper, we actually try to see that after the, uh, the global financial crisis, South Korea uh, essentially strengthened its capital controls, right? So we think that actually has a large impact on firms' choice of their foreign currency debt. Um, uh, so, so that's why we, we just focus on a period like a post uh, Asian financial crisis, but before the global financial crisis. You can see that in our theory, we actually do not have like a capital controls, especially like a heterogeneity of capital controls on different firms, right? So we do not have this kind of information, at least at this point. And also for, uh, for the uh, comment on that, whether you are optimistic on the balance sheet effect is going to have a muted uh, consequence. 
so the key is our thinking, right? So we, we actually, in our paper, we have a, a placebo test. Essentially, we, if we use the, uh, look at the relationship between export share and the foreign currency debt share before Asian financial crisis. And we, we try to argue that during this period, the exchange rate's volatility is not large. So maybe that firms are not so prepared to, uh, to do this kind of a hedge. So the, we, we try to see that only when you, know, you have a very large volatility of your exchange rate, uh, after 1999, uh, we, we, try, we can observe this uh, 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 strong uh, or positive, or significantly positive relationship between the export share and also the foreign currency share. So I think in this regard, uh, we are on the same page, right? So because before 1999, we do not expect the firms actually do a lot of this operational hedging. So uh, we are also not going to be surprised by the fact that there are going to be, you know, South Korea's firms are affected a lot by the exchange rate depreciation uh, in the macro level uh, during the Asian financial crisis. So, so that's uh, uh, our, you know, uh, quick thoughts here. Uh, but for sure, we will think uh, more about your comments. Uh, and it would be nice that uh, we can ask your slides and then we, we learn more from that. We'll try to address. So I, I guess one follow-up question on that is, um, do you have the data for the post-global financial crisis period? Because there I would also expect that you'd see more of a role of market-based finance in addition to the bank-based finance. And um, you know, just wondering if you think there's any difference um, in what we would expect to observe. So a very good question, I think. So in our paper, we do not distinguish between, you can see that we do not distinguish between uh, the bank loans and the uh, market bonds, right? So uh, that's basically due to the data limitations. In our data set, South Korea's data, firm level data sets, when we have the uh, currency composition of the firm, we actually do not have uh, that kind of, you know, uh, separation of corporate bond and uh, the bank loans. Uh, however, we think that uh, for Bank of Korea, they should have this type of very detailed data. But for our case data, we do not. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and our third paper for today in this uh, very well integrated session um, is uh, trade finance and the durability of the dollar. And here we'll turn to Rosen Volchev from Boston College, joint work with Ryan Chah. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, thanks to organizers for including our paper in the program. And um, I want to give thanks to Salim ahead of time that he's going to discuss in a little bit. Um, as Linda mentioned, this is joint work uh, with Ryan. And then what we do in this paper is, I think it's actually right, very well integrated. We want to think about dominant currencies. Um, and we want to think about uh, how they arise endogenously, and in particular, why the coordination on a single dominant currency stable through time. Kind of this, this focus on the stability through time is I think where our paper would depart the most from the literature. I don't think I need to give much um, motivation perhaps for the idea, especially in this, uh, in this uh, session. We're all familiar with the long lasting uh, dominance of the dollar. And I just thought in here some easily available data that I, I take directly from G2 and all about official foreign reserves. And you can kind of see there's a dollar you know, it's been a dominant reserve currency for many decades. And what's interesting, you know, we've got some fluctuations here. They kind of look like fluctuations around a stable steady state, but nothing much is happening. There's some big shocks along the way. The Euro gets introduced right over here and it's, you know, you can't even really see anything happening. Um, but it's not the case that the dollar was ever like this God-given uh, dominant asset, you can clearly see in the beginning of the sample here, a clear transition from a different steady state that I can't quite see here because my data cuts out, um, but it used to be the pound was dominant and it can, kind of plummets over time. It, it looks pretty steep, but it does take like 20 years and the dollar comes up and then the dollar stays up uh, for many decades. So understand this in the um, dynamic stability with the potential of switches is what we're after here. And in, in a model that's going to be in full general equilibrium, it's going to be fully dynamic, so it can help us uh, eliminate some more standard macroeconomic questions. So the um, 
Altera, the key question of interest here is number one, why is there endogenous coordination on a single dominant asset in an otherwise ex-ante framework? I think that's a question that has been studied a lot and a lot of people have interest in this. And what we're adding to the table that's a little bit different is a, the second part of the question is why is the coordination stable through time? And we're gonna provide a model that's going to look very familiar to a lot of macroeconomists, international macroeconomists, that we can then use to also do a lot other quantitative analysis and that I'm gonna showcase. Now, but let me explain to you a little bit um, what the mechanism is about, what's the intuition? The intuition of the mechanism rests on two key frictions. Um, and I'm going to argue that both of them are well uh, grounded in data. Number one, there's a limited contract enforceability across countries, which means that there is a need for trade finance. And it really was well integrated so far in the session. And hopefully everybody knows that trade finance is important by now. What we mean by importance of trade finance is the importers and exporters, they need to finance their operations, but they also need to finance their transactions in order to provide guarantees to each other that you know, 30 days or 60 days from now, then we sign the contract now and we only get the goods or the payment 60 days from now. And it's across borders. So if you know I have to go sue somebody, it's very complicated. So we need to provide some guarantees that are kind of more marketable, more liquid. And that's where trade finance really plays a big role in international exchange. So trade finance is important. We need some sort of, we're gonna have some friction in transactions, but there's also financial friction. So there's a, this dual frictions are gonna play an interesting role. For, trade finance is important, but it's not immediately and infinitely available. Okay, so we're going to model this as a search and matching credit market for these trade finance relationships. In terms of the data, this idea that kind of the original dollar rise was underpinned by trade finance is well established by Barry Eckingreen in many works. Um, in current kind of the current landscape, if you look at trade transactions, international trade, 90% of it requires some sort of external financing. Uh, there's a paper by Obwan. Um, and, but there are frictions in this trade finance world. Um, people estimate that there's almost $2 trillion of a trade finance gap. What they do essentially is they aggregate trade finance applications that get rejected. So it's not, it's not the case that a trade finance market is frictionless and we're just kind of sitting at some sort of a marginal benefit equals marginal cost point. Um, and trade finance is heavily dollarized. So the, the, the sense of dominance that we're going to use in our paper is going to be dominance dominant use of the dollar in terms of trade finance instruments around the world. So letters of credit, for example, 80% of them are in dollars, but there's a pretty detailed re relatively recent report the, by the BIS about other types of trade finance. They also are heavily dollarized. Great. So these, these two frictions and how they work, um, there's going to be an interaction in our model between the incentives to save in an asset. Think of there being two X anti-symmetric assets. I'm going to call one of them dollar bonds and one of them euro bonds. And then there's these small open economies that the rest of the world is composed of these small open economies. They don't have their own asset and they're trying to figure out what do they want to save in. Do they want to save in dollar bonds? Do they want to save in euro bonds? Now this interacts with an incentive on the side of trading firms who are using trade finance to uh, collateralize their transactions. And the firms also have this choice. They can either apply for a dollar-based trade finance loan or for a euro-based trade finance loan. Now, where's the interaction? The interaction is that I'm applying for these loans from the households in search and matching markets, where essentially the households list their kind of the assets they have in terms of dollars and the assets they have in terms of euros, kind of they do two different markets. And the more assets I have in terms of dollars, the less tight that mark credit market essentially is. So this is a higher incentive for the firm to apply for dollar-based trade financing. But now if all these trading firms around the world are using trade financing, they're actually paying some fees to the households back for that, you know, for the right to use their assets in this, in this form. There's also going to be some split of surplus in this credit, uh, credit transactions. Well, these fees are essentially going to end up underpinning an endogenous convenience yield in whatever asset ends up being selected if, on whatever asset we coordinate on for using uh, for international trade. Okay, so there's this, there's going to be this interaction actually between households and traders and if, if firms decide to use dollars, um, households are going to save in dollars motivated by the endogenous convenience yield. But if the households, households are saving in dollars, then the firms themselves would want to trade in dollars because it's easier to obtain that kind of trade financing. Okay, so there's going to be this interaction. This is going to generate multiple equilibrium. I'm gonna call this multiple equilibrium, multiple steady states. Um, and I'll go with details of why they're steady states in particular in a few slides. What's interesting about our paper is that we're going to introduce a second This interaction here, which is between the firms themselves, importers and exporters. They're going to be the standard idea that when I'm transacting with a counterparty, 
we want to kind of have the, the collateral guarantees in the same currencies. And because of, if our collateral guarantees are in different currencies, then we didn't really do a very good job of completely kind of um, giving a safe guarantee to each other. Now, this, this complementarity between, between firms actually interacts with the complementarity between firms and households and it counterbalances it. Intuitively, the distribution of asset holdings around the world is going to act as a coordination device for the firm for to firm complementarity. The firms are going to observe that their likely counterparts are likely to prefer to fund themselves in whatever currency, whatever asset is widely held around the world. And this is going to anchor the currency choice equilibrium is going to be stable through time. Effectively, we're kind of like going to be anchoring the currency choice equilibrium to a slow moving endogenous state, which is going to be the portfolio composition of savings around the world. Okay. And then I'm going to show you quantitative analysis in full general equilibrium. It has its own insights. Welfare benefits are quite interesting and counterintuitive. You think that the dominance is great, but if you only look at the steady state, actually, it's not much to talk about. The, the, the main benefit of dominance comes in the transition period to dominance. So if you think about the case for the US, we probably are way past the point at which we're earning a lot of flow, uh, so sort of a lot of gain uh, flow gains. So I'll be more specific about this in a second. So here's kind of what the framework looks like. There's going to be three regions, the US and another region I'm going to call Europe. Think of it as Euro, Eurozone. And these two big regions, the big countries are the ones that issue the safe assets. I'm going to make everything ex ante symmetric and they just kind of issue two safe assets that are otherwise perfectly identical and in the exact same supply. The key frictions are two. There's this trading friction where when I want to trade with another country, with, with a firm from another country, I want to get one of their differentiated goods. I cannot do that directly. We, we have this friction where I have to post collateral to um, collateralize my transaction. And then there's a second friction of where do I get my collateral where I have to borrow it in certain matching markets. We're going to be borrowing it from, from the local households. Okay. And why the local households? Because really the most interesting actors here for us is this third region, which we call the rest of the world, this continuum of small open economies. The big countries, we kind of assume that they just use their own currency. They're not very interesting. We had an old working paper in which their choice was also endogenous, but they're not very interesting. The interesting actor is here, the rest of the world countries. So let me focus on them in a simplified version of the model, which hopefully transmits all the intuition. And then we're going to go back to the big model for, um, uh, into it, uh, for the quantitative details. So just think of it as two key actors. There's some households in this rest of the world that are choosing to save in dollar or euro bonds. And there are some firms who want to trade internationally. So what, is the firm, what does the firm's problem look like? The firm only has this choice of whether do I want to um, apply for dollar-based trade finance or do I, do I want to apply for euro-based trade finance? And it's effectively, it's objective function V is going to be the relative benefit of applying for dollar minus the benefit of applying for euro. What are those driven by? I make some profits. If I'm successful in obtaining financing, I'm going to make some profits. I'm going to take this as an exogenous constant right now. And later, we're going to endogenize it in the big model in terms of equilibrium trade profits and flows. And there are two interactions. One, this kappa is a mismatch cost. If I get matched with someone else, an importer or an export from another country that uses a different kind of currency than me, the surplus is going to be reduced. And then there's an interaction with, with my own households, what kind of asset holdings of my own households, because I need to obtain this trade financing. And the probability of obtaining trade financing is your standard search and matching uh, probability. It looks like a, like a market tightness kind of thing. There's a matching function. doesn't really matter which we choose, but for analytical results, we choose a particular one. There's a matching function, and I divide by how many people are looking for that kind of financing. And if too many people are looking for that financing relative to how much is available, the probability of obtaining it is lower. So it's going to make it less desirable for me to obtain dollars, for example. On the other side, we have the households. They, say, they solve a standard consumption savings problem, they're essentially just choosing whether to save in one asset or another asset. This is a perfect foresight model. There's nothing about risk here. It's literally just, just equating the expected rates of returns of uh, different assets. And the interesting thing about the rate of return of these two assets is that it features an endogenous liquidity or convenience premium um, because I can you know, have this asset and I just don't just get the coupon payment from the from the government, but I can also then turn around and lend it in these trade finance markets. It's kind of like a reverse repo. I can lend it in these trade finance markets and then obtain some payment. How much is the payment? It depends on what's the probability of matching with a firm that wants my asset. Okay. So now this is the feedback loop through that credit market. If households hold a lot of dollars, the first 
perceive high probability of being funded with dollars, so they're going to apply for a lot of dollar loans. But if the firms are applying for a lot of dollar loans, well, then the households perceive a high probability of lending these assets, so they're going to indeed hold a lot of these assets. The convenience yield is going to be high. Now, this interaction is going to give rise to uh, three steady state equilibria. What we can characterize analytically is only steady state. So think about stationary equilibria where all the t's are the same through time. And quantitatively, it's going to be fully dynamic. Um, but for what we can do analytically is just steady state. So everything is the same through time. But there's three of them. Um, they're kind of intuitive. There's a dollar dominant one. All the firms are using dollars. And the households in this, this case are actually at the corner. They don't want to hold any euro assets because the dollar, dollar saving dominates. Um, another one, another um, equilibrium is a euro dominant one, and there's also multipolar equilibrium where both assets are used. Now, up to this point, if I only think about this financial friction, anything goes. If I only think about financial friction, if the households just change their portfolio composition, they can go one way or another way. Now, I want to make this. I want to make this a little bit more stable through time. So that's where the interaction of the two coordination uh, incentives is going to take place and, and they're counterbalancing each other. And in particular, and, and actually it's a little bit more intuitive to just think about the firms trying to um, trying to interact with each other. If the firm in country I thinks that everybody else is going to be using dollars, it's likely to also choose to finance itself in dollars. If the firm in country I don't think everybody else is using euros, it's going to use euros. In other words, there's a potential for sunspots. But the bonds and kind of the financial friction of the search markets are helping act as a coordination device. I cannot just quickly change my trade finance mix by just conjecturing what everybody else is going to do because there are finite amounts of this financing available. And the tighter the market becomes, if everybody's rushing into a particular market to ask for that kind of loan, the less the probability of actually obtaining that loan. Intuitively, kind of looking around the world, the distribution of assets around the world serves as a coordination device. If I see all the rest of the world's small open economies having heavily dollarized portfolios, I'm going to predict or infer that my counterpart is likely to use dollars as trade financing as well. So I would prefer to use dollars. And then we can kind of anchor our coordination stably to that, uh, at that um, steady state or at that equilibrium. And, and, and the stability, and the, the, we can show analytically and show in, uh, quantitative, but I don't have much time. So just intuitively, the stability requires a balancing effect. You kind of want it to have just enough coordination incentive across firms so they don't overwhelm the financial friction. But at the same time, you don't want to make the financial friction too big because if the assets are so scarce everywhere, then you're always going to be in the multipolar steady state. That's the only one who's going to be stable. The way to make the dominant currency steady states both stable and not subject to some spot shocks, so to be determinant, is to have an intermediate value of capital, an intermediate value of coordination across countries, which is kind of going to balance out the financial friction and the currency mismatch coordination. Okay, so then we go to the big model. We're not a bunch of things. Most interesting is this pie, the profit that we make from trading abroad is, is going to be your standard incentive to trade for differentiated assets because my consumption function, consumption basis likes, likes variety. And then it's going to be an endogenous markup because of these frictions in trade. And all of that's going to be funding the profits and it's going to be also funding the convenience yields. Um, we're going to calibrate the model to a number of targets. Um, I'm not sure how much time, maybe I'll skip, but you know, stuff like how much of these assets are available? How much, how big is the rest of the world in terms of trade? You know, how much they use dollars in their trades and so forth. And then here's the results. I got, so first steady states, we do indeed have three steady states in the bigger quantitative model as well, just kind of in the analytical model. Um, they're not at the corner. We, we smooth out essentially that. So instead of um, being at the corner, the, it's, it's less than the corner. The rest of the world uses 80%. That's something we target in a data, 80% of dollars. Um, we have an exorbitant privilege. This endogenous wasn't targeted. The dollar interest rate is about 1% lower than the euro interest rate. And you think that this is a great deal for the Americans, right? You think this is a great deal for the US. But what our model says is that the dominance of the US must be supported by very wide holdings of dollar assets outside of the US. Another endogenous thing that comes up is a very negative net foreign asset position of the US. So these two things actually go hand to hand. People often take the net foreign asset position is kind of exogenously given, and they just calculate the interest rate spread and then say, wow, the US is earning so much money, effective student rate is like almost 1% of GDP. But actually our model says to obtain that spread, you have to kind of like let the world get a lot of your assets. You kind of have to be internationally indebted. Now at steady state, maybe that doesn't make too much of a difference. These two, at steady state, these two things offset, right? Like having a balance with a low interest rate. 
So where is the benefit? The benefit is in the transition. So let's talk about dynamics slightly. There's a, so this black dot in the blue region is your dollar steady state. The big blue region is my way of illustrating that it's dynamically stable. So if I start from anywhere over here as initial conditions, I'll um, um, uniquely converge to the dollar steady state. And I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm speeding up a little bit, but you know, there's a similar <clears throat> Euro steady state on the other side. Now, let me talk about transitions. Let's imagine a counterfactual transition from the multipolar, multipolar world, which is our calibration is actually unstable. And this is, why, this, this is how our model interprets why dominant currency regimes are kind of the, the norm and you don't really see multipolar world. Well, the multipolar world is basically unstable. And why is it unstable? It's because it, our, our model says there is enough safe assets out there so that we can coordinate on just one of them. And then that coordination is stable. So the transition from the multipolar world to the dominant currency world is a great deal for the Americans. So once you reach a steady state, you're going to be heavily indebted. So that offsets the interest rate differential. So at steady state, you only get 3% um, basis point gain in permanent consumption. If you include the transition is 75 basis points. Why? During that transition, the Americans enjoy elevated consumption throughout. Why? Because this negative net foreign asset position, you reached it somehow. You issued a lot of kind of assets, kind of you let you were able to sell a lot of your assets at a high price to the rest of the world, but that's during the transition period. Now that in that transition period, though, that's a great deal. You get a lot of benefits from it. All right. Um, I probably have only like two minutes, so let me show you one counterfactual. This this euro um, euro introduction has always been a very interesting event in my head because you know around ninety nine and what people wrote back then was that the euro now is suddenly going to move us to this multipolar world that I think people at the IMF have dreamed about for quite a long time, um, but it never really happened. It, it, the, the dollar dominance was barely changed. So does our model, can our model help us understand this? And yes, our model helps understand it because if you start in a world which was highly asymmetric, here our benchmark calibration is symmetric. Eurozone and US are ex-ante identical. But imagine now the Euro was very small. It was only Germany. So then this orange area doesn't actually exist. There is no attractive alternative steady state. Only the blue area exists. And so before 1999, we lived in a world that would we uniquely only one steady state. We closed state close to it. Then we open up this other possibility of the orange world over here. But because everything was already dollarized and our model is heavily path dependent, we were within the attraction region of the dollar dominant steady state anyways. So even though there's now there is the possibility of a transition, just just Putting that possibility on the table doesn't mean that the transition is going to start. You need a big shock to precipitate it. So if I kind of just look at the data and things like interest rate spreads or dollar use throughout the world, I'm not going to see much of a change in the dominant position of the dollar. But underneath that, it is somehow more fragile because if I had done a different counterfactual world where the Eurozone kept growing and growing, let's say the UK and Sweden all join in, now the eurozone is much bigger than dollar in terms of safe asset capacity to provide safe assets. And that what that's going to do is going to expand this orange area. Okay, you're going to expand the orange area relative to the blue area. It's going to be a very asymmetric world, and that could precipitate a transition. At that point, we could precipitate a transition, and a transition is a great and really bad deal for the U.S. You can kind of see what happens to the U.S. consumption over here in the red line. Um, if, if, the, if the Eurozone had really grown so much to precipitate a transition, it, the US would have lost about 2% of permanent consumption. Why? Because you're not only, switch, yeah, rapid, because you're not only sw uh, swapping the interest rates, but you also then you have to reduce your net foreign asset. No one is going to fund your, fund your minus 40% NFA GDP anymore. You have to go back up. So then that's, that's a painful transition. Um, yeah, I can, I can wrap up. Thank you. Stop share. Um, thank you. And our discussant is Salim Bahaj from the Bank of England. Thanks so much, Linda. Thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. Can you hear me okay just before I start? Is that yes? yes. Thank you. Okay, so great. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper. It was a pleasure. It was very interesting as well. Uh, I just want to jump in and start with just, I think, putting the paper a little bit in context. Um, and then I'll, I'll have some specific uh, comments on, on uh, what they actually do. So I think I shouldn't, I don't really have to tell this audience that, uh, you know, the international monetary system depends, uh, sort of tends towards having a, a dominant currency. We, we all are aware of that. Um, and there have been a number of, of papers recently and in, in the past sort of explaining potential mechanisms that sort of push 
the monetary system in, in that way. Uh, and actually, I think those, those theories, and this is a point that, that Rosen also makes in his paper, align with the basic role of what a currency is, right? So you have you have the unit of account idea that actually Daisuke talked about in the um, in the, the first presentation today, where you have price stickiness, uh, and that can generate strategic complementarities with either competitors or suppliers. Uh, and that can mean that um, uh, firms, trading firms have an incentive to coordinate on particular currency. Uh, you can take a view about, about a store of value and a particular currency is, is best placed to be a global safe asset or a view based around the medium of exchange that uh, if you have search frictions in, in, uh, in payments or in, in, um, in transactions, it makes sense for, for people to coordinate on a particular currency to make those payments, right? to, to limit those, those, uh, those search frictions. And the recent literature have, have basically started putting these ingredients together. Um, and so there's, there's Gotham and Stein that, that I think slightly is a caricature, but talks about these, these first two uh, ideas and combines them in, into a model. Uh, and what they find is basically, you know, when, once you start combining these ingredients, they actually mutually reinforce each other and you get a greater impetus uh, towards a, a dominant currency, which is in a, a stable equilibrium, which is a point that, that, that Rosen also makes. And what this paper does is, you know, goes in a similar direction, but I think kind of adds the, the, the medium of exchange uh, with these search frictions in, 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 uh, in financing to that idea as well and indicating a similar result. So one thing I'm going to discuss is, is how to relate this paper to the to go up on our sign framework and basically how you should think about these different frictions and how they combine. But before I do that, let me just explain in a nutshell how I think at least uh, Rosen, Rosen's models work. Uh, so there's two, there's two key frictions. So uh, imagine I'm, I'm a, a trading firm in a small open economy, uh, the sort of rest of the world uh, block that he's referred to. Um, I need to get some collateral for my operations. And I'm going to go out to my households and, and try and search for that, that collateral. And that collateral could be in, in dollars or, or in euros. Okay. And I have to go out and search. There's a chance that I won't actually find someone in, in the right collateral that I'm, uh, I'm looking for. So if I search for euros, I won't find the euros. Or if I search for dollars, I won't find the dollars. Um, uh, and if we do match, that's great because I get my collateral and the household then gets a fee, okay, that, that, that the firm will pay them. And that collateral was required for trade. So if I want, want to go ahead and do international trade, I have to have this collateral and that's sort of this, this financing friction that, um, that Rosa mentioned. And the issue is that if I've got a dollar bond for my collateral and my counterparty has a euro bond, there's a mismatch and we have to pay a fee uh, to deal with that mismatch. So some sort of hedging costs or something like this uh, to address that mismatch. So how do things play out? So imagine that in my country, I'm, I'm the home trading firm, suddenly more of my households start holding dollar assets, dollar bonds. It makes it much more easy for me as a trading firm to go out and search for dollar collateral because there's a higher probability for me to match. Okay, that's the sort of the search friction coming in. And because there's a higher probability of a match, um, the household is more likely to get the fee. So sort of a, as a convenience premium that rises on, on dollar assets. And so households then also want to hold dollar assets. So that's sort of the first, the first loop going on in, 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 the, in the framework. Okay, so the value of, of, of dollar holdings will, will, will rise those, for those firms, for those households. At the same time, you have this, this second friction, which says that, okay, if, I, if I'm as a home trading firm having more uh, dollar collateral, then my trading partners abroad are also going to think, okay, fine, we should dollar collateral too because that produces a chance for a mismatch. So we'll start, we'll start doing this. Uh, we'll start looking for, for dollar trade financing, dollar bonds, okay. And that then loops back to me because I, I want to match with them. So we have this strategic complementarity and in, in the choice of trade financing uh, between um, home and trading. Uh, firm. So that's how, how the model sort of plays out. And you can see that you know, this can be very stable um, and, and both the portfolio choice of households and the firm's uh, choices feed off each other um, in the framework. Okay. And it's actually really tractable. I, I know I sort of did it with arrows, but the maths is, is, is very straightforward and it can be embedded in an energy framework, uh, I think, in a, in a very impressive and clean way. And they generate lots of results, which I do not have 
anyone in a time to go through. Uh, so they talk about determinacy, dynamics, uh, welfare, uh, and, and various counterfactuals and, and policy experiments. It's very rich in, in that sense. Uh, my comment zero, uh, just on, on, on the mechanism itself before getting to the bigger picture, is that I, I, find, I found the explanation of the key friction quite abstract, in particular the way traders finance, this idea that we sort of exchange collateral and, and there's a mismatch. And I think it would be just, you, know, you, also, you have a letter of credit in mind, that's how I kind of interpret it, but I think just exposing that better in the text would be helpful exactly how we think about um this friction in practice would be would be useful with, to a reader or just provide the, the, the micro foundations in the appendix uh like how would you get to this uh that sort of uh, framework um from, from a standard model of trade financing uh, i think that would be very very useful for a reader okay so a uh, bigger picture of comments though is you know, how to relate this to the literature. So the, there's Goffman and Stein, which has a similar kind of loop, but it's a slightly different mechanism and they have different predictions. So let me, I'm gonna very briefly explain what they do. I just need to do that to make my discussion work, unfortunately, so I have to do two papers. Uh, so what they have is the idea that um, uh, foreign trading firms increase the use of their foreign currency. And because households are consuming uh, foreign inputs, they then demand holdings in that particular currency um, for the purposes of liquidity, they want to, they want to make sure that their 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 holdings match the the currency of of um, of the uh, uh, consumption goods they're paying for, basically. Okay, and to do that, they they basically deposit the dominant currency, the dollar, at local banks. That means that banks need to supply uh, assets in that currency somehow. They need to match the deposit of the assets, and they supply those. That, that dollar lending uh, to home trading firms, okay, and they're gonna they're gonna take on these these dollar loans, and they'll start then in turn, as, we, as we've seen uh, in the previous presentation, pricing their their exports in uh, dollars. And the key friction in, in this paper is that uh, basically home firms can't fully collateralize all their dollar loans, uh, and that means it's like an excess supply in a sense of of dollar financing, and we get a UIP. Uh, violations so dollar dollar assets are more valuable than, than uh, foreign currency uh, loans and because you know home currency home trading firms are, are using the dominant currency the same mechanism applies in the foreign country so, so that's that's a that's a very similar paper what separates them is there's differing predictions regarding the supply of assets right so Goldman Stein if, if you if you actually have the US printing lots of dollars and supplying the assets you kill off this UIP violation and, and uh and this part of the loop goes away. And, and actually increasing the supply of the assets uh, makes a currency less likely to be dominant. Whereas in, in Rosen's paper, a different uh, effect happens. All you do is basically amplify this part of his, his double loop. You make households more likely to hold dominant currency and, and that just kicks out everything and, and, and you, you strengthen the effect of, um, of, uh, of a dominant currency by increasing its supply, okay? I think that's really interesting. Uh, I actually don't have a strong sense of who's right on this. That was, that was, it was a real puzzle to me when I was reading the paper. So who's actually got the right prediction? Um, to an extent you think about, you know, the, the clamor for, for a Eurozone safe asset as uh, suggesting um, what Rosen's doing. Rosen's saying is actually sort of more, more compatible with data, or indeed what, what China's doing when they're trying to expand the overseas availability of RMB is very much consistent with this sort of idea. On the other hand, there's other stories you tell as well. So it's definitely the case that if you look at the, the uh, 1920s and you go to the historical data, uh, I mean, UK obviously uh, did very badly in terms of maintaining the status of the pound by expanding the, the supply of selling assets. I'm just showing you what happened uh, in the, in the pre-World uh, War I and, uh, and uh, pre-World War II period where there was a substantial supply of increasing the supply of selling assets. Obviously that, that generated the rise in, uh, in the role of the dollar. And it's also interesting in the sense that the period where we did have sort of two currencies vying for dominant status in the interwar period, the dollar's status uh, was, was very strong in the 20s where the, the amount of US debt relative to, to sterling debt was declining and actually faded in the 30s where it went in the opposite direction, which is counter to, to what Rosen is saying and more in line with Goppen and Stein. Um, having said that, there's other things going on in, in the 20s and 30s where you have capital controls, depressions, et cetera. So it's, it's, you know, this is just a, a perspective to, uh, to bear in mind. Uh, there's also a, a 
point regarding what actually happens to this convenience people. So in Rosen's paper, uh, as you increase the supply of, of debt in, in the economy globally, the, the convenience premium on the dollar rises. Um, and that's also, I'm going to sign up the other way around, it will fall as you increase the supply of dollars. Uh, and that's also not what we see in the data. So if you look at the Krishna Murthy versus Jorgensen results, this is, the, this is the latest version of that database, the data 2018, the convenience premium is definitely falling um, in the uh, amount of, of debt outstanding uh, in the US. Uh, and this is you know, over a period where the US dollar was both dominant and not dominant, actually. They have data from the 30s and 20s in here as well. So that's sort of counter to, to Rosen's point. But again, there could be other, other frictions that uh, explain this. OK, uh, the second comment I wanted to make was just this idea of the, the collateral uh, mismatch cost. This isn't this isn't really calibrated in the paper. It's it's a key friction, and they mentioned it's really important for making uh, the equilibrium determined. Uh, but in the end, their calibration just sets it at the minimum value to ensure determinacy. I, I think you probably could do a little bit better. Uh, so um, one interpretation for this, and maybe this is the wrong interpretation, but at least that's how I thought about it, is that imagine I have a, a euro bond, and your counterpart wants dollar collateral because they have they have a dollar bond. What do you need to do? Well, you need to swap out the exchange rate risk as, as a euro bond holder. Uh, what's the cost of doing that? What's the actual fee that you should be paying, which is a parameter model? Well, it's the price of a synthetic dollar bond, so the price of a euro bond swapped into a dollar bond versus an actual dollar bond. Okay, and, and that's that's the CIP deviation effectively. Uh, and you know, we can we can measure that. Uh, I put it on the right for for a three month um, contract, accounting for uh, uh, bid ask spreads, etc. And the average price post crisis is around 40 basis points wholesale. So what a bank would pay if you actually add, you know, maybe double that for a retail transaction. I'm not sure what a retail cost would be, but that's just a, a rough figure. You're actually getting quite close to the calibration that, that, that Rosen is using. They use 100 basis points for the cost. So I think that's encouraging, but at least you, you can you can back it from uh, from the financial market data by doing that. But what's interesting, obviously, this cost has moved around a lot. You can see the time series uh, here. Um, but also it's something that's risen a lot since the financial crisis when the role of the euro has actually declined. I was wondering whether if you if you added, say, 50 basis points to your collateral mismatch, could you actually explain the declining role of the euro uh, since the financial crisis? And also, I think there's a, there's a policy implication. Please wrap up, uh, Celine. It's time, time's up? Please time's wrap up, up. you say? Please, yeah, yes, I have my last point. Um, so uh, a policy implication is, is it, is it the case that actually making it harder to hedge your currency, if I'm a dominant currency, is a good idea? Would that help me sustain my dominant status? Um, that seems to be something that comes out of the model. I want to just, just ask that question. And lastly, it's, this is a kind of throwaway comment. I'll just make it to wrap up. Um, you have this medium of exchange view, and I just want to make the point that that's actually something where the dollar is not so dominant. So it's, it's much more dominant as a, as, a, as a store of value, as foreign exchange reserves, as, as, a, as a currency uh, for international debt. When it comes to things like payments, uh, the euro and the dollar are much, much closer. Uh, and I just wanted to throw that in there. I know it's outside your model, sort of the payment system, but you have a medium of exchange interpretation. So I think it's worthwhile just making that point. Okay, I'll close there. It was a very interesting paper. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you very much, Salim. Um, are there other comments from other session participants? Don't be shy. Okay, let me jump in. Um, also to add, um, you know, as, as um, I, so I, I, I like this uh, model a lot. Um, I did wonder about kind of how general is the general equilibrium in the sense of um, volumes of international financial flows and the way that currencies use so dominate the amount of international trade uh, that's done. So capital uh, flows so dominate uh, trade flows. And, you know, I, I know when post Bretton Woods, we thought about the, we not, people thought about the structure of the international financial system. 
Um, I don't think it was anticipated how much there would be uh, international capital flows and the vol volatility of those flows. So your model, I think, basically has them similar magnitudes. And so how should we think about the, the, the mismatch basically on those types of values? And if you were to think about um, the collateral point more broadly, I think uh, you would get to, um, and this goes to the net foreign asset position, you'd get to thinking as well about what happens when there are QE programs that absorb uh, some of these uh, safe assets, what happens, you know, on the other side, if there is a, a euro bond that makes for um, a more liquid pool of unified uh, safe assets. So anyway, maybe you could um, comment a little bit about that. Um, um, so let's turn yes. it over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for all these questions. They're, they're, they're very interesting. There's a lot of them. So let me try to see what they can get to. Um, this, the size of capital flows. I mean, I think that's a very interesting question. So I should highlight that what we do here is kind of like a first step really in the research agenda. Um, it's a perfect foresight economy. I described the dynamics and the steady states and everything. And I think now we can go ahead and do additional macroeconomic analysis where there are going to be shock. There's going to be volatility. I think the shocks and volatility are important in order to understanding capital flows. Um, because that's that's a that's where a lot of the volatility in, in the capital comes from. Now, in in the current version of the model, and where everything is perfect foresight, there there's still capital flows. Um, you, you could say, right? If you, if I can think about the steady state, the fact that the emerging markets are saving in dollars or euros, it, it's saying something about capital flows. Um, and in terms of calibration, it's it's not like an order of magnitude different, but the, but the size of asset trading that's going on is actually about twice as big as as trade and even though you point, you're thinking that maybe they're roughly equal because kind of the trade thing is is driving which asset I'm saving in. That's totally true. But the but the financial friction actually means that uh, there could be there could be a disconnect between how many assets I have for how much trade actually gets intermediated um, because there there's congestion in these markets. So everybody wants to save in dollars and everyone wants to borrow in dollars. So we're still saving in dollars, but we're only lending out a few fraction of what I'm saving. But it's still the best deal for me um, uh, to save in dollars. I think the QE programs are very interesting. It is indeed, and I'm, that's going to be the last thing I'll say because we are running out of time. The QE programs I can think of kind of like more like temporary shocks, they come and go. And I wanted to brought, bring this distinction between temporary shocks or local changes and what I think is global changes, especially on the asset supply. I, I think there's a point to be made about fluctuations around a steady state and some sort of a systematic change in the economy that might push us from one steady state to another. When we, draw, when we try to draw a distinction between us and Goppenstein's paper, which I like, and they have this very different view, kind of, I mean, the real world is very complicated. They talk about a different thing about the banking sector. I think that's also definitely empirically relevant, but they are only a static model. So when we compare to them, we only think about the static implications of our model as well. And the question about asset supply increasing is about moving from one steady state to another. So think about a big change in assets such as that uh, we, could potentially shift us from one state state to another. Such big changes, their model would say, would go, will favor whoever manages to restrict their assets. And our model actually says that whoever manages to expand um, the availability of their assets. But what um, uh, Salim showed, I think is super interesting, this historical perspective. Unfortunately, we kind of cut off some discussion we had in the paper, but some of this historical perspective, at least into my eyes, is more fluctuations around a steady state. And now if I if I take as a given a steady state, kind of take as a given that we're now in this regime in the traction region of the US steady state, the trade is already dollarized. Further changes in the supply of dollars is not going to change how many more firms are using dollars. So kind of like the, the demand for liquidity is fixed. Once I fix the demand for liquidity and I still vary the supply of that asset available, you get that downward sloping relationship. Um, it does look very similar to the uh, Krishnamurti this uh, young and result. Um, and that this is one thing where we think that, you know, we can take this model and if you want to do a big DSG analysis with super many states, you could just log linearize around one of our steady states. You're going to have this convenience yield that's going to be endogenous and it's going to be fluctuating both to due to demand and to supply uh, uh, factors, but the demand factors are very tiny around the steady state. The, the, the demand factors really play a big role if you consider shocks that can push you from one kind of equilibrium to another kind of equilibrium where suddenly everybody stops drawing dollar-based trade finance but starts drawing euro euro-based trade finance.
Um, thank you so much, Rosa. And I thank everyone. We are over time, um, but this has been a terrific session. And um, really, you know, your papers, um, you know, logic works so well together. And I hope we can all have more dialogues on this in the future. So thanks for all of your great inputs and um, looking for, for more from, from all of you. So thank you very much. And we could conclude. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you very much, Linda.